This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning Ty Andros, Ty is the president of TraderView, publisher of the Ted Bits website, and writer and editor of his very, very well-recognized newsletter and a long-term newsletter named Ted Bits. Good morning, Ty, and welcome back this month to Macro Analytics. Thank you for having me. Ty, it's always great to have you. You've got out another article that I wanted to talk to uh, you about this morning. I noticed that John's got it rated as best on the web. It's a diamond over at Market Oracle. So, and that's just the first ones here I saw this morning, so I congratulate you on another great article. I'd like us, Ty, to, uh, to go through it for you to give us some of the highlights of the, of the messages. As others have recognized, it's a great article, a Misery Spread Widely. And I have up one of the, uh, the slides that you brought with you this morning. Well, you know, Misery Spread Widely to me is the definition of socialism. And as uh, the um, policies are put in place by global socialists, it kills growth and misery starts getting spread in bigger and bigger circles. And uh, we are in the death spiral. Of course, you know, I'm as disappointed as anybody uh, that uh, Romney uh, wasn't uh, elected because uh, I was hoping that the process might be slowed for a few years. Um, but uh, that wasn't the case, and we're now in a position where socialism is uh, basically our political system, and, you know, socialism ultimately leads to a collapse of society and character. And, and that, you know, I'd like to read this, uh, this quote from uh, Will Durant, because um, it's really a description of the world today, uh, or at least the developed world. Uh, a great civilization is not conquered from without until it has destroyed itself from within. The essential causes of Rome's decay lay in her people, her morals, class struggles, her failing trade, her bureaucratic despotism, her stifling taxes, and her consuming wars. And um, that is the definition of Europe and America today. And uh, we are going to uh, follow that. Uh, uh, we're going to see a course of the economy ha happen that will get human behavior uh, that will be the opposite of what we see here. And the pain will continue to ratchet up and uh, happen in the future until uh, we change the way we think and change the way we vote. And, you know, we all of a sudden want to become self-sufficient and reward those that uh, do so and, and reward prudent behavior and people who want to produce more than they consume rather than eat them. And um, we have uh, in place a uh, government uh, now that's been reelected in uh, the District of, Corrupt uh, District of Corruption um, that uh, has now got a green light uh, uh, to uh, you know, really accelerate uh, what they've already put in place. Well, most of it really was put in place during the first two years of the Obama term, but most of it was real, all the really ugly stuff was postponed till after this election. And now people are going to know what they voted for. Um, this next slide we're looking at, uh, Gord, is um, really uh, the small businesses of America, uh, the so-called rich, uh, these terrible people who own little plumbing services and restaurants and small businesses and medium-sized businesses, and they're really the backbone of America. And they're being murdered. And they're being eaten. And, uh, of course, they're being murdered and eaten, eaten by uh, the constituents of the people that are in charge of the Beltway. And what I'd really like to point out here is, is look at that bull market and what the small businessman is saying his problems are. And, of course, look when it began. It began 
on the day Obama was elected. And uh, these people are being just relentlessly attacked. 80,000 uh, new pages of regulations every year. Um, the stimulus bill, which was nothing more, had nothing to do with stimulus of the private sector. It was a permanent expansion of government from 19% of GDP to 24%. Obamacare, the politicians are taking over the healthcare sector, which is 16% of the economy. Dodd-Frank, uh, making uh, the financial system more political. And so this is where we see a bull market in regulations and taxes. And it's set to explode higher as regulations and implementation was postponed after the election. What I'm hearing, Ty, from small businessmen pretty consistently is the degree of uncertainty for the length of time that we've had it. And when I talk about uncertainty, economic, uh, tax-wise, regulatory-wise, has put the small businessman in such a position they can't take any risk. They're not prepared to spend more money. Right now, we have capital expenditures, CapEx, in total freefall in America, not just the small business and medium, but right across the board. And what I'm hearing indirectly is a lot of these third and fourth generation family businesses are scared going into next year, absolutely terrified. And it's the elements of the fiscal cliff, but the, the Obamacare and the fact, and I'm just, I'm not trying to pick on Obama here. I'm just trying to pick on the, the uncertainty that is paralyzing the country, that they're now fully and aggressively trying to move to part-time uh, workers. I was just reading one guy who owned 37 fast food uh, franchise chains, and that's all he was doing right now before Christmas was trying to get the majority of his employment to part-time workers to avoid the costs that are going to hit so that he could survive. Well, how wonderful, because they call a part-time worker employed. And so we're going to have the employment numbers uh, show great big new hiring because there's going to be spreading the same amount of hours uh, out among more people. Well, when we go through the details of this month's uh, uh, great labor numbers, that's exactly what you're going to find. It's just an explosion in part-time uh, workers. Yep, contraction in full-time workers. And, and additionally, Ty, not just the contraction of full-time workers. What you're going to see, and pay real attention to this, is you're going to see the, the hours work change, but also the rate at which they're being paid. And it's not match. It's not even coming close to the rate, real rate of an inflation. So the way the wages themselves are, are being compressed, and we've seen that as we talked about previously in disposable income. So with these fictitious U uh, three numbers, but when you start to get into the U six and the other numbers, our, our employment rate effectively has got to be pushing twenty percent now. Well, you know, John Williams has it there, but uh, it's going to affect the very people that have elected these uh, socialists. And uh, it's uh, great uh, because, uh, you know, that pain's an important emotion gourd. If you don't have pain, you don't uh, alter your behavior, and they're going to have it in spades. And, uh, you know, it's prosperity and capitalism, competition, innovation, prohibited by law. Ty, you made a really good point there, and that's so true. Unless you have pain, you don't adjust you don't adjust your behavior. And so what we do is we paper over pain. And we hand you food stamps. I'm a big supporter in trying to help the, help the needy. You don't even use food stamps now. You've got a credit card. You just flash and away you go. So the amount of transfer payments that we have and the growth as people run out of the, the 99s now move to dip permanently disabled, the games that we're now playing doesn't enforce any pain. All it forces you to do is start to figure out how you can feed off the trough more effectively. Well, I just uh, saw a report, Gord, where it showed that uh, a woman with a couple of children um, really is better off if she only makes uh, $29,000 a year and gets on all the government programs than if she took a job for $60,000 a year. You know, talk about perverse incentives. You know, somebody's got to pay those uh, the difference there. And, of course, it's you and me and Bobby McGee, but mostly it's a printing press. And it'll continue to be, and that is just uh, also confiscating wealth from the very people that have voted for these policies. Here's Tom Donlan of Barron's, and uh, I started this off with a with a couple of uh, quotes. Some issues are settled. Obamacare will shake up one sixth of the economy if the bureaucracy can make it work. The Dodd Frank law will rule financial services. Again, if the bureaucracy can make it work, you know, according to Davis Bacon, 
uh, Polk analysis, uh, Davis Polk analysis, excuse me, only 33% of 398 rules have been put together. The law is ambiguous and other reviews suggest the figure could be 500 major rules. Um, so we really have a lot of major pain. Uh, and a major rule to the listeners is one that costs more than a hundred million dollars of costs. So when we are talking 500 rules in Dodd-Frank, we're talking $50 billion out of the banking sector and into politically directed lending and compliance costs, which produce nothing. And, uh, you know, we now will have the EPA and Energy Department uh, that are going to resume their wars on inexpensive conventional energy, and such as oil, natural gas, and coal. If you thought the gas prices going from 180 to 350 uh, was bad, you look for it to double again in the next four years. I mean, the coal, uh, uh, Obama has promised to put the coal business, the coal energy business out of business, and uh, that will take place. Uh, coal was, uh, I don't know, 40% of our energy mix uh, when he took office. Now it's 30. You know, you can expect that to be 10 when he's done. Okay. And uh, they really don't have anything to replace it with. So, you know, we're going to, the rationing is going to be happening by price. And, um, you know, they the way they think of, uh, of uh, energy is you make clean energy affordable and profitable by making conventional energy inexpensive. I'm sorry, expensive. You know, but how many times have, like uh, Donald said, how many bureaucracies have made it work? Let's see, they haven't made the post office work. They haven't made Social Security work. They haven't made the public schools work. They haven't been able to make Medicare work, Medicaid, energy policies failing, and everything else they've taken charge of to protect you. And of course, they sold it to the highest bidder who keeps putting them in power. Now, you, you know, you, most people don't understand that the, you know, it's uh, big government uh, progressives and they're Republicans and Democrats. I call them the Gaudis and the Gambinos. And they fight turf wars known as election to see who gets the front row, uh, fleecing the public. Ty, if people want to understand how government doesn't make anything work, I mean, you just had a, a wonderful list, and we could expand on that. Uh, we just went through a hurricane up here in the northeast called Sandy, and everybody remembers those pictures of Katrina years ago and I, how mad everybody was because the government wasn't doing anything as the people were at the stadium and out on the highways as the looting went on. Well, Sandy's been long gone, and we still don't have power. We have people in 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 Staten Island, all along the Jersey Shore, that are, are, are without the basics of, of, of existence right now. They're having to be housed if they can even. The government has not stepped in to any degree in any magnitude, even though the promises are being made. So uh, the point I'm trying to get to, the government isn't capable. It never has. It just can't do the kinds of things that we would think it can. And when you get into complex regulations like you're spelling out here, a hundred billion dollars is, is minimal tie of total waste, but at the end of the day, it just gets in the way. Well, Gord, you know, you just need to look at the, the different um, disasters. You can look at disasters in the Northeast, which is, I'll call it, very progressive uh, uh, democratic states like Illinois and Massachusetts and New York. And then you can, like, look at huge floods happening in the Midwest, and you never hear a peep about it. Because those people go and clean up after themselves, and they know that the government's not going to be there. And you don't hear about great big rescues in Nebraska and Iowa and other places when these natural disasters happen. Um, so, you know, the government is completely incompetent. And, uh, of course, uh, we've uh, punished people that are, um, you know, self-reliant. It's uh, something not to be admired, but to be attacked. Ty, it's not just the government and their response that we're talking about. The government regulations and everything else they are putting pressures on corporations and companies and small businesses' ability to do their job. So let's pick on Sandy here. Right now, you know, what I saw with that is when I step outside my premise and we're in this middle after the storm, all I can hear for as, as for 10 or 15 miles is the hum of generators kicking in. 
And, and on that, what's happened is everybody up here in the Northeast have now starting or have been installing own, their own private generators so that they have backup power and backup because it's so consistent. Now, why is that? We only have, it's just Sandy. No, every time we have anything, a Nor'east or any kind of storm, we face that. And you get inside it because the power companies have cut back on their staffs. They don't have the backups. They don't have the resources. They don't have the parts. All in the improvement pressures that they're under for our profits. And our society is so tenuous and so fragile, uh, Ty, that we're, we're not robust. That what happens within three hours, your modems are down because the, the repeaters don't work. Within six hours, your cell phones are down because the, the towers don't have battery backup, etc. The system comes crashing down. And even us who had generators couldn't pump gas into our generators because the gas stations that had gas didn't have electricity to run the pumps. And my, my point is we have moved and, and stretched our economy as we pilfer so much money whether through crony capitalism, ineffective regulations, that our, our society's coming apart at the, at the, at the seams. And I would say, you know, it's through the course of Sandy, it makes me feel like we're living in a banana republic. Basic uh, infrastructure services have been neglected uh, to pay entitlements and government workers and everybody else. But, of course, they really arguably don't produce anything. And so the money to modernize the electrical grid or create uh, good roads or uh, properly uh, update and modernize infrastructure, that money has been diverted. And so uh, which the primary, you know, uh, purpose of government to me is to provide common infrastructure uh, so that people can go about being as productive as as possible in their personal lives without the government assistance. But now uh, we're to the point uh, um, where all of the basic infrastructure has been eaten and it's been eaten by the something for nothing society. I'm sure you know, Gord, that actually if you really look at the government finances, uh, um, the discretionary part of the budget is now all borrowed because all of the total tax revenue now goes to entitlements. And so the government, uh, uh, from from day one of the year, is uh, is financed by borrowing, and I'm talking about the energy department and the and Congress, and you know all of the all of the executive branch is completely on borrowed money. And uh, you know uh, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, those entitlements need to be cut to, to the point where the government is financing itself, and of course. You know, we're sitting here looking at the physical cliff, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But, but you know, going to the next slide, Gord, um, you know, uh, let's let's look at what's happened. We've really seen Chicago and in Illinois-style political corruption on a national scale. And here's a quote from Valerie Jarrett, who is really Obama's closest and most senior advisor other than his wife, uh, during a recent meeting with uh, – their uh, group in in Washington, D.C. After this election, it's our turn. Payback time. Everyone not with us is against us, and they better be ready because we don't forget. The ones who opposed us will get what they deserve. There will be hell to pay. Congress won't be a problem for us this time. In other words, they don't care about the laws. No election to worry about after this is over, and we have two judges ready to go. And who is she saying this to? She's saying it to, to trade unions, hardcore socialists, AFL-CIO, UAW, SEIU, crony capitalists. You know, they, they, they these people paraded through the White House uh, since the election. And, and as you well know, too, the biggest corporations in America really don't pay taxes, do they, Gord? They've, they've, they've really weaseled their way to deductions and, and uh, special uh, tax provisions that uh, – they really pay zero. Uh, the the uh, the the people that really pay taxes are small businessmen like you and me, and um, you know that's so, so why it's so easy for them to recommend raising taxes on the rich because it's certainly not them. And uh, you know the trade unions are just uh, trying to live off the I'll call it the carcass of the private sector. You know um, there was a you know they they killed the golden goose. 
But uh, the gold goose is going to get carved up quite a bit more going forward. And, you know, Romney talks about the 47%. It's actually quite a bit more than that. I think it's at 60%. These people are really set to eat the private sector alive. And, and of course, they'll kill it. Uh, they'll kill our futures and, uh, and uh, foment uh, the collapse into d dictatorship that uh, we believe is going to happen. Um, well, going to the next slide, you know, this is uh, what's uh, going on now uh, uh, is a massive re redistribution of wealth. It's called the, the fizzle cliff, but it's really what they planned when they expanded government and passed o Obamacare and, and Dodd-Frank in the 2008 to 2010 super session where they had veto-proof majorities. And uh, they're now... Uh, they expanded government by 5%, and now they're going to take 5% of new taxes out of the private sector, transfer it to themselves to squander. Okay, this was the plan when the stimulus bill was passed. Well, like I said, millions of people are going to be moved back on the tax rolls, and of course they're feverishly working to prevent that from happening. I don't believe it'll happen because there's no money. The rich are are taxed to death now. They already pay most of the taxes. And so it's the little guy that's going to get it and they'll try to blame somebody else. But that was the plan. And basically it's uh, funds are moved to government consumption, misallocation, and capital destruction. Government spending is not an investment and don't believe that it is. But $506 billion is uh, what? Uh, I don't know, 4 or 5% out of the hide. And and that money is just going to be flushed down a toilet, literally. It's a massive redistribution of wealth from the private sector to the Leviathan government. And, you know, they'll give a few dribs and drabs to their supporters. And going to the next slide, uh, uh, what we've done is here is we've just shown a little, a little example of what's going to be coming out of people's weekly paychecks. And for a small uh, group, for the you know the thirty-four, thirty-nine to sixty-four thousand dollar area, the the middle twenty percent of income, it's going to be two thousand dollars a month, which is I don't know one, two, three, four percent out. Uh, but uh, when you get to the top twenty percent, man, it's fourteen. And um, these, you know, we're really in this country been turned into modern day serfs and tax slaves. You know, how many car payments and mortgage payments and insurance payments and personal consumption or retirement savings that they planned on having, they now aren't going to have the money for them. So do you think there might be some, some people not paying their bills or paying their creditors? <laughs> do you think that economic growth is going to, uh, going to go from here? Uh, no, it's going to kill it. And it's only the beginning, as you, you know, Gord. Ty, when I look at non-performing loans in almost any category, they're just, they're continuing to increase in some at staggering rates. And the, the, the one that's just going absolutely parabolic right now is the, the defaults on student loans that parents just can't carry. And because, and even if they're not defaulting on that, they're uh, behind payments in other areas to be able to fund the payments there. This slowing economy and this bleed that's going to come out of it. And even with the, you know, we'll come up with something with the fiscal cliff, but no matter how you cut it, there's going to be a tremendous bleed on an already stalled economy. Whether we're looking at Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or student loan or anything that the government uh, does, uh, it's more of a welfare program because there's certainly not any underwriting standards applied. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you have the income or you're going to get an education that can actually repay the loan. Um, it's more of a, of a, a freebie to keep people from, you know, um, rioting. You know, when you have unsound money and it's all, it's all un in unsound money. Okay, uh, your paycheck may stay the same, but uh, it always buys less. So uh, they're will the bankers are willing to let you keep your lifestyle, but they're going to lend you the money for it. Okay, so what they're doing is just uh, turning people into debt slaves, and debt slaves, uh, which they really have no ability to repay uh, for the most part, because. They didn't check to see if they had the ability to pay it before they loaned them the money. And they're very confident, they, the lenders, because out of something called regulatory arbitrage, they're effectively passing all the risk and the debt back 
not to the individual who assumed it, but to the government who then takes it over. And we've seen that time and time again. And I'm right now the, the most current debacle that's going on is the FHA. You'd think we would have learned with Fannie and Freddie Mac, but nope, the FHA, it's, it's absolutely, it's bankrupt again. It's going to need funding and bad lending practices. And, and out of it is we're passing all of, all of these bad decisions back to the taxpayer. And of course, that's a shrinking uh, number of people. And it's going to continue, although they're going to have a big expansion of it here. But, uh, you know, as people lose their jobs and stuff, taxpayers are going the way of the dodo bird. And, um, you know, because there is nothing, nothing other than redistributed money. And, you know, we really have fingerprints of a recession, or I'll call it the ongoing depression, uh, um, emerging. And I call them canaries in the, in the coal mine. And what we're seeing here is a year over year, uh, no loan growth, uh, no corporate loans, uh, all through the Eurozone. And, you know, we're really a Ponzi economy. So if credit's not growing, you can bet that those economies aren't growing. I've got the same numbers for the United States, Ty, and, um, and, and what's happening is just amazing how credit has really stopped growing. Uh, right across with the with the households um, in the United States, so it's, it's a it's not just it's all of the developed countries. It's the same kinds of, of charts. Well, you know, median income here uh, since uh, the chosen one took uh, took office uh, went from I don't know fifty four thousand to fifty thousand. Uh, you can expect uh, uh, you know at least an acceleration of that. And the next thing that we're looking at here, Gord. Uh, Going to the next chart is, um, you know, capital spending, which uh, you've spoken about a number of times. And there, no one's investing in the future. No one's investing in plan and equipment. No one's investing in structures. Well, if you don't invest in plan and equipment and, or, you know, future capital investing, uh, are there going to be any jobs created, Gord? Well, they're creating jobs, Ty. They're just not creating them in the developed world. And I, I say that. I was just finished reading a report. As you know, earlier in my career, I spent a fair bit of time with the IBM Corporation. And IBM has stopped releasing numbers on the size of its, its corporation. But uh, the numbers I was reading indicate the United States population employment is now only 96,000 people, which is a staggering reduction. But that's not really as key as the fact that India – which I remember they were just starting and putting people in there, is now 116,000 people. So maybe now it's the, the uh, Indian business machine company because they have more employees in India. And it's because of, and that's where the capital's going. That's where they're investing. That's where the Thomas Watson Research Centers that have moved out of the United States and have moved into India, into Japan, into the other other countries. So capital is being invested. It's just not being invested in the developed countries. And, of course, for it to start being invested here, they have to have a wholesale repeal of regulations. They have to have a wholesale repeal of of letting people uh, keep the money they earn. And uh, all the incentives to invest and produce in America have been pretty much removed. And if they haven't been removed, they will be in the the near near future. And, uh, you know, when we look at this slide... uh, Michigan sentiment today had a crash, didn't it, Gord? It was down the most in months. Well, it, what st- surprised me out of that time, not that it crashed, was that it had the, the separation between business confidence and the consumer and Michigan confidence numbers were completely diverging dramatically. I had never seen them diverge like that. And it said somebody's wrong. And my opinion was that it was the uh, consumer sentiment. And uh, and I still can't figure out how it managed to defer that way. So I don't know if it's crash. It's just actually starting to begin to point down to closing the gap. So there was, I think, what my opinion on that was, Ty, the market had been going up. And people, when the market's going up, for some reason, sense that it's uh, that things are positive. But the market is discontinued from uh, from Main Street. And people should fully appreciate that. Those those days of what's good for General Motors is good for the economy are, are history. And I, I say General Motors figuratively of, of stock prices. Well, uh, what, what we've got here is we've got credit uh, contracting year over year. Uh, uh, we have uh, investing in future plant and equipment uh, declining. And now the last one is industrial production. 
in the advanced world. And of course, it's gone to zero as well. I mean, the only place it shows growing is the United States. And I promise you, those are, you know, from the Bureau of Misinformation. So we have kind of a three strikes and you're out uh, look at the economy right here. Well, I would add the uh, add retail sales uh, to it, Ty. The whole consumption end of it, of whatever we look at, is actually and has been on a long term trend, secular uh, falling off continuously around the world. And and recently, um, we, we've certainly seen in the United States. But if you look at auto sales in Europe right now, they're up, they're 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 crumbling, which is a reflection of the of the consumer not having the money. And I've spent and worked in Europe, and I can tell you that uh, the European economy is incredibly dependent on the automotive industry, and incredibly. Yeah, even at uh, $9 a gallon gasoline on average. Oh, I, where, where do you get it at $9? I was paying $11.30 in, um, in Vienna, and uh, close to that on the ring road in, uh, in Paris. We all know where this is headed, and it's not a pretty picture. And, um, you know, societal chaos lies ahead. But, uh, you know, we're really in a centrally planned world. I call it uh, the Washington, uh, the District of Corruption. And I've got a little cartoon here, but unfortunately it's too true. But you can, you can really, you know, uh, just say ditto Brussels, uh, ditto Spain, ditto Germany, ditto Frank, France, ditto the UK. Um, it really is a chorus. And it's a chorus of, uh, People collapsing economies and uh, seizing power over others uh, as the pie continues to shrink. And if they don't get this pie to start to to start expanding soon, and they won't, um, we're really in trouble. And and uh, in conclusion, you know, I put together a little uh, thing on truth and consequences here, and uh, this is uh, my bottom line. Uh, the developed world is now firmly in the hands of something for nothing constituents and their socialist masters, masters in their respective capitals. As economies let, they inhabit cascade lower under their policies, past, present, and future, misery will be spread widely and farther. Misery spread widely is the product of socialism. As real growth disappears and money printed out of thin air fills in for the lack of income growth. It is paid for in a variety of ways, but the bottom line is the money you're paid and store your wealth in buys less and less, while, you balance, while your balance in the bank stays the same. As politicians loot and plunder the private sectors to pay the unpayable promises and support those that don't produce by enslaving those that do for the crime of leading a prudent and productive lifestyle, they're going to be, they're creating the disincentives to do so in the future. So we're going to have less prudence, less productive, and less of a future. The attacks on wealth and job creation are set to accelerate. What, what, you know, cause like as the pie shrinks, you know, they all have to fight over what scraps are left. And that's what socialism is. You know, what was a temporary capital investing and job creating strike by the private sector in the United States, States before the election will now become a permanent one. Small business is done and will not revive under the current administration in Washington, D.C. or in progressive states. Because as we know, there are some anecdotes of success, uh, Wisconsin, Texas, Florida, there's a number of states, Indiana, uh, even Ohio is reviving under a conservative uh, government. But the chosen one's goal is not to spur economic growth and job creation, whatever he says it is. It is to foment economic collapse, grow government dependence, and gather power as the man-made disaster unfolds. He's going to take everybody's freedoms and redistribute what wealth is left to the special interests that have put him in charge. And I've demonstrated a few of them. You can expect an unlimited debt ceiling to be enacted soon, with no spending restraint or reforms implemented. The printing presses are about to go into hyperdrive. Something for nothings are in charge, and they're coming to eat us. Ty, we're up against our hard line, and I, I really do thank you for the for the time here and taking us through this um, this great article that you just put out. Um, you know, and I, I wanted to talk to this article today. You know, it, it, as we wrap in towards the end of the year, and we're going to have another session where we actually recap 
2012. And a lot of the things we're, we've talked about, I'm sure our long-term listeners have, have, have heard us talk about before. It really does distill it down today and to show us where we're, where we're at and how a lot of the things that we were talking about when we used to do a show called Global Insight are coming true at a faster and a faster rate. It's amazing. Ty, any last comments you'd like to make here in, um, on this article or anything we've talked about today? Um, I'd like to say this is not doom and gloom. This is the greatest opportunity in history. Um, we are out there to inform you so that you can put in place, uh, uh, you know, the things that you need to protect and grow your family and your wealth. Um, this is a great opportunity, but you can't get to the wealth and the opportunity by uh, following what we've been doing the last 50 years. And uh, so it really takes a applied Austrian economics and it takes a deep faith in God because God knows we're going to be tested. Um, this is history repeating, but it's repeating on the grandest scale you can imagine. And, uh, you know, those that uh, forget history are doomed to repeat it and we're going through that cycle again. Ty, could you... Tell, share with our listeners how they could uh, learn more about your work and, and maybe specifically how they could uh, get a hold of you on the kinds of solutions that you bring to the problems we're talking about here today. Well, um, you know, my newsletter is free. Uh, it's at tedbits.com and anybody can sign up to it. You know, we have tens of thousands of readers. We have some, you know, 10,000 regular subscribers and depending on where we uh, we uh, post uh, it's, you know tens of thousands more. Um, but if you're looking for professional assistance, uh, I'm an absolute return alternative investment ske- specialist. And what that means is I'm going to help you fix your paper. I'm going to help you. Uh, fixing the paper means your paper currency so that you can store wealth in it again. I don't believe you can make money until you restore sound money. And then what I do is I help you identify professional managers who can help you make money as these realities are priced in. And they don't really care whether the markets are rising or declining. They're experts and have put together systems that allow them to identify low-risk opportunities, put you in them in a heartbeat, and then professionally manage the risk. And as as you well know, Gord, uh, doesn't matter how good the system is, if your risk management uh, is not good, uh, you will fail uh, because nobody knows the future. But uh, you can bring it probabilities into your favor and, uh, you know, get the wind at your back. And uh, what uh, can be a setback for your neighbor can be actually uh, uh, an opportunity for you. And I recommend that everybody diversify their portfolio and use applied Austrian economics to uh, to do so because the maelstrom that we're going to go through is going to be life-shattering for most people. And I'd really like to uh, help as many people as I can go from shattered futures to uh, ones that are volatile going forward, but uh, uh, they really can have expectations of, uh, of uh, protecting and building their wealth. Ty, I'm going to have you back here in another uh, week, a uh, couple weeks, so that we can do a, a recap of 2012 and go through and highlight a lot of the um, the key messages that, um, that we've delivered on the close to 10 hours of tapes that, um, that we've done together. So I'm lo- really looking forward to that. And with that, uh, the best of the season to you, and I look forward to our next session. God bless you, Gordon, all your listeners. Thank you. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.